Nicknamed the Great Grey Green Greasy, the Limpopo River is one of Africa's largest rivers. It serves as a border between Zimbabwe and South Africa, and it also happens to be one of the most dangerous places on Earth. A town in South Africa called Falaborwa sits on Limpopo's shores, and all of its residents know they're never supposed to step foot inside of the dangerous waterway, but not all of their residents take that guidance seriously. On January 1st, 2010, Falaborwa resident Mariska Beitendog, along with her boyfriend and six of their other friends, had been out all night partying celebrating the new year. They had had a considerable amount of alcohol over the course of the night, so as the sun was coming up, in their inebriated state, they decided they wanted to take an early morning dip in the Limpopo River. So they head over to the river, and while initially they all seemed really eager to get in the waterway, it was only Mariska that was brave enough to do it. So the rest stayed on shore, and Mariska jumped in the river and jumped right out again. And she survived, and everyone was very impressed with her. And so she's confident, and so she does it again, this time going a little bit farther out into the river before coming back on shore. Now she's really confident, she's done it twice. And so she said, hey, who wants to come with me for a third time in? And the group said, no, we're still good, and you really shouldn't push your luck. This is not safe. And she said, I don't care, I'm going in for a third time. So Mariska gets in the water and by herself, she swims out on her back about 15 meters away from shore. She turns and waves at the group and smiles before she is violently pulled under the water. There wasn't even time for her to scream. Her boyfriend immediately jumped into the water to try to pull her out, but he knew where she was and there was no way he was getting her back. The other nickname for the Limpopo River is Crocodile River, and Mariska unfortunately had fell victim to one of its apex predators. But it's not just drunk partygoers that fall victim to these crocodiles. Unfortunately for the residents of Zimbabwe, because of the extreme hardships they have to face, many of them have been forced to flee the country and cross over the Limpopo River to try to gain entry into South Africa, and many of them will die trying. On April 11th, 2014, Zimbabwean and South African police discovered this crocodile-infested cave right near where Zimbabwean residents will try to cross over the Limpopo River, and inside of this cave were the remains of 15 people that presumably tried to cross over and were caught by crocodiles. The discovery of this cave and the 15 people who lost their lives inside of it, while tragic and certainly gruesome, it only represents a fraction of the total number of people who have died trying to cross this river. The next story, which is our number two story on today's list, is called No Way Out. In 1986, 35 million Americans went to see the brand new movie Crocodile Dundee, which was a comedy that starred this very capable and rugged Australian crocodile hunter who goes to New York City. One of the 35 million Americans who saw this film was a 24-year-old model from Virginia named Ginger Meadows. And after seeing this film, Ginger felt inspired to actually go to Australia to see it for herself because it looked so amazing in this movie. So a couple of months later, in March of 1987, Ginger, by herself, hops on a plane and flies to Perth, which is a major city in Western Australia. And her plan was she would land in Australia and then work odd jobs to make a little bit of cash and then use that cash to fund her travels all over the country. And then at some point after she was tired of doing that, she would head back to the United States. So she lands in Perth and immediately she sees her first opportunity to make some money. There had been this huge sailing competition in the city leading up to the weekend she arrived there, and so she saw all these luxury yachts anchored at all these docks along the coastline, and Ginger's thinking to herself, you know, these huge ships, they have crews that work on them basically full time, maybe one of these boats could use an extra set of hands. And so Ginger, who was very friendly and outgoing, she went right down to one of these docks and she stopped in front of the very first yacht she saw, which was this huge luxury 100 foot yacht. And she introduced herself to the captain of this boat. And she said, hey, you know, can I hitch a ride with you guys to the next place you're going? And in exchange, I'll work for you. And as it happened, the captain was actually looking for another crew member to assist their chef. And so he said, okay, well, can you cook? And Ginger said, yeah, I'm a great cook. And he said, okay, well, you're hired. You can be the chef's assistant. And so Ginger, she climbs on board and she meets the rest of the five other crew members, including the chef who she'd be working with. And the chef's name was Jane and those two would become very close. And then shortly after Ginger had come aboard, the captain cast off their lines and they headed out to sea. 
Their next stop was going to be New Guinea, which was roughly 14 days of travel away. After about a week at sea, the captain realized they were dangerously low on fresh water, and so he decided to take a detour and turn east and head inland along this river system that would bring them to this large freshwater pool, which he also knew had this huge waterfall that dumped down into it, and so he figured they could go right underneath this waterfall and fill up their jugs with all this fresh water and then head back out and they'd be good. So on the morning of March 29th, the captain anchored the yacht out at sea near the mouth of this river system, and then he lowered the yacht's dinghy, which was a smaller, more agile boat. And once that was in the water, he, Ginger, Jane, and the rest of the crew, they hop in this dinghy along with all these large, empty water jugs, and they begin making their way towards this river. And so they're traveling up this river for a little while, and then finally they get to this huge freshwater pool, and right in front of them is this amazing waterfall, and everybody is just totally awestruck by this waterfall. It's like a gem in the middle of nowhere because they're in very rugged Australia at this point. And so the captain, he brings the dinghy right near the base of the waterfall and one by one, they hold up their water jugs and they fill them with fresh water. And then they're about to turn and go back out to sea and get back on their yacht. When the captain thinks to himself, you know what, we've been at sea for seven days straight. It's been very monotonous. Maybe it would be a good thing to stick around here for a little bit longer and maybe even hike up to the top of this waterfall and enjoy the view and kind of enjoy the scenery before we head back out to sea. And so he says to his crew, hey, do you guys want to go to the top of this waterfall? And everyone agrees it's a great idea, with the exception of Jane. She did not feel like hiking to the top of this waterfall. She said she would stay down in the dinghy and wait for them. Now, this pool is basically surrounded on all sides by just pure cliff face. There really is no place to land this dinghy. There's no flat surfaces. You basically have cliffs that go directly into water, and then also you have the river that feeds back out to the ocean. So the captain brings the dinghy right up against the cliff face right next to this waterfall, and he and Ginger and the other crew members not named Jane climb out of the dinghy onto this cliff face, and they begin climbing, literally climbing up this wall towards the top of the waterfall. Now, everyone was able to do it except for Ginger. She kept slipping on the rocks. It was very steep. It seemed kind of dangerous. And so at some point, she abandons the idea and goes back down to the dinghy with Jane and the captain and the rest of the crew, they continue up towards the top. And so as Ginger and Jane are sitting in the dinghy watching the other crew members making their way up, they start feeling a little bit left out and they're like, you know what? Let's try to find an alternate way up to the top of this waterfall. And so they begin scanning out across this pool at the other cliffs kind of surrounding it. And it looked like on the very other side of the pool, there was a less severe cliff face that maybe they would have an easier time climbing up. And so the two women, they jump into the murky brown water and begin swimming directly across this pool towards this other cliff. And when they make it about a third of the way, Jane suddenly stops and Ginger notices and turns around and looks at Jane and she's like, what's going on? And Jane would tell her, you know, something just feels off. This doesn't feel right. Let's go back to the dinghy. Let's just forget about this. But Ginger is like, come on, we're so close. Let's just keep going. It'll be awesome once we get to the top of this waterfall. And so Jane, she's totally hesitant, but she says, okay, fine. And they both continue to swim. And then all of a sudden, they hear their captain, who is now on top of the waterfall, screaming down to them to get out of the water right now. And they notice he is pointing down at the pool in a direction slightly away from where they were. And so they're looking up at him, and they're following his finger down to the part of the pool he's pointing at, and they see there is this tidal wave of water coming towards them. It is a 12-foot-long saltwater crocodile that has noticed them, and it is charging straight at them. Now, Jane and Ginger knew they were too far away from the dinghy to be able to swim to it before this crocodile was going to reach them, and so their next best choice was just to turn and swim towards the nearest cliff face, because again, there is no place to get out of the water. There's only cliffs. And so they swim towards this cliff face, which is right on the edge of the bottom of the waterfall, and so water is landing on them, and they reach the cliff face, and they're trying to climb up and pull themselves out of the water, but there's nowhere to grab onto. It's all totally slick, there's no good handholds, and so all they have is this little ledge that is in the water that they're standing on, but they're still halfway into the water. And so after they struggle for a minute trying to pull themselves out of the water and they realize they can't do it, they both just turn around and they lock arms and they look out through the water that's falling down in front of them into the pool and they see this crocodile has followed them and it is now stopped right on the other side of the water that's falling down and it's just staring at them with its mouth wide open. 
and the two women are looking at it, they don't know what to do, and the captain and the other crew members, they see what's going on, and they're trying to climb down as fast as they possibly can to try to rescue them, but it's gonna take several minutes at least before they get down to the dinghy, and so Jane and Ginger, they're totally aware of this, and they're just staring at this crocodile, screaming at it, trying to get it to go away, and at some point, the crocodile does just close its mouth and sink below the surface but now they don't know where it is, and this causes Ginger to completely panic, and she lets go of Jane's arm, and she dives into the water off to the right and attempts to swim away from the crocodile back over to the boat. But Ginger only made it two strokes before the crocodile suddenly re-emerged underneath her and grabbed her by the waist and pulled her under the water. Jane is just standing there watching all of this happen in front of her. She has no idea what to do. The crew is still not down in the dinghy, so she's totally stranded. And she's just staring at the area where Ginger has been pulled below the surface. And just seconds after she's been pulled under, the crocodile re-emerges with its head pointed towards Jane. And in its jaws is Ginger. And Ginger's got her arms up over her head. She's wide-eyed. And she's looking right at Jane. And Jane makes eye contact with her, but there's nothing she can do. And she just walks watched as Ginger again was pulled back under, and this time she did not come up again. Ultimately, Jane would be rescued from the ledge. The crew would get down to the dinghy, they'd swing over, they would pick her up, and then about two days later, they would find what was left of Ginger's remains. It would turn out the captain was well aware of the threat the crocodiles posed in this river, and he had told his crew, Ginger and Jane included, about this threat, and that at no point should anyone get in this water. But, of course, his warning went unheeded. The next and final story, so our top story of today's list, is called Blackwater. At 11.40 a.m. on December 21st, 2003, three young men who were longtime childhood friends hopped in a truck and began traveling south. They were 22-year-old Brett Mann and 19-year-olds Sean Blowers and Ashley McGuff. They lived in a coastal city called Darwin, which is actually the capital of the Northern Territory in Australia. The Northern Territory, also known as the Top End, is located in the central north of the continent. It is six times larger than the UK, but has 280 times less people living in it. Specifically, the UK is home to roughly 70 million people, whereas the top end is home to only 250,000 people, and half of them live in Darwin. There are many reasons why the top end is so underpopulated, ranging from politics to poor infrastructure, but the most obvious reason that so few people choose to live in this part of Australia is because it is wildly rugged and dangerous. It is scorchingly hot year-round, and the weather in general is just unbelievably unpredictable and violent. And, as the old saying goes, all the animals there are trying to kill you and each other. But Brett, Sean, and Ashley had grown up in Darwin, and so they were accustomed to the hazards of living in the Top End, and so they weren't really concerned about them. What they were concerned with was finding things to do and not getting bored in the city. That particular day, in order to ward off boredom, the trio had decided they would head out to a salt flat that was located about 50 miles to the southwest of Darwin. It was this wide open plain that they could just race around on their quad bikes on. And so they loaded these quad bikes into their trailer, attached it to their truck, they hopped in their truck, and at 11.40 a.m., they started heading south out of Darwin. The first road they were on was this fairly desolate dirt road that wound around through the wilderness and it passed by the iconic eucalyptus trees that are very well known in Australia. It passed by palm trees and giant termite mounds. And after driving on this dirt road for about 30 minutes, the trio passed by the Tumbling Waters Holiday Park, which is a vacation resort for adventurous families. And then beyond this park, there really was no more civilization. They were headed right into the outback of Australia and so this was kind of like the last mark of civilization. And so the trio, they drive for another 30 minutes past the park, and at some point, all of the trees on either side of the road start getting more and more dense until they begin kind of encroaching over the road as if it looks like you're driving directly through the heart of a jungle. And they would have recognized this change in scenery as meaning they were nearing the Finnis River, which was off to the right beyond all of the trees. So they couldn't see it, but they knew they were close. And the Finnis River was not a huge waterway. It was a 30-mile stretch that ran east to west through the 
top end, and what it was known for was being very brackish and dark. You could not see into this water more than maybe an inch or two, so it almost appeared black. And so the trio continued driving along through this kind of jungle atmosphere until the left side of the road began to thin out again, and then it eventually revealed the salt flats up to their left. And so at that point, the trio pulled off on the right side of the road where the vegetation was still very thick. And then the trio hopped out of the truck, they went around to their trailer, they dropped the gate, and one by one they pulled their quad bikes off, and then each of them hopped on and drove out onto the flats. That day, the flats were actually very muddy because it had recently rained really, really heavy in that area. And so the trio spent just as much time racing each other on the flats as they did trying to drive close to each other and spray mud on each other. And so for hours, they were out there having a great time. And then at 4.30 p.m., they decided it was time to call it a day. And so they drove back over to the truck. They drove their quad bikes up onto the trailer. They locked it. And then they were about to get into the truck to head back home when one of them suggested, hey, let's head down to the water and rinse our clothes off and get all this mud off of us. Now, you need to understand, in the top end, the place you want to spend the least amount of time in is the water. People in the top end assume that in any natural water body that is not clearly designated as a swimming area has at least one animal lurking in it that will kill you. This is a literal precaution people in the top end take. And so this section of the Finnis River that these three friends were thinking about going and jumping into and washing off inside of, this was not a clearly designated swimming area, and so it should be avoided. But you need to remember, these three guys, they grew up in the top end. They were used to living in this kind of wild area, and they'd also come to the salt flats so many times over the years, and they had jumped into the Finnis River before to wash off and go swimming, and nothing had ever happened. And so really, the idea that the Finnis River could be dangerous to them, it didn't really cross their mind. They felt like, you know what, we've been there, done that, nothing's going to happen to us. And so they left the truck and walked away from the salt flats into this mangrove forest that's only a couple of feet off the road and began walking towards this river. Normally, the trip from the road through the forest to the river bank, basically where the forest ended and you reached the river, it would take about 10 minutes. But after walking in this mangrove for maybe a minute, they were already standing in river water. It was only a couple of inches of this water, but it signaled to the guys that clearly the river is very swollen from all of the recent rains, enough so that it overflowed beyond its natural boundaries and it's flooded the mangrove forest. But the three guys, they look at each other and think, meh, what's the big deal? I'm sure we'll be fine. And so the guys continued moving on, but as the mangroves began to thin out, they began to slow down dramatically. But because the riverbanks on the edges of the Finnis River were very, very steep, if you were standing on dry land, if there was no flooding, and you were right on the edge of the Finnis River, if you took even one or two steps into the river, you would slip down under the water and the water would be over your head. Now, as these guys are walking, because the ground is flooded with this black, brackish water, they couldn't see the ground, and so they couldn't tell where the drop-off into the river was. And so they began to slow down, and then when all the trees were practically gone, they knew they were close, and then one of them actually slipped and kind of tumbled down the edge for a second, but he turned and he grabbed one of the roots of the mangrove tree and pulled himself back up. And then the other two, after seeing this, they walked over and stood next to him, and the trio just stood there looking out at this pitch black looking river that was very clearly moving faster than normal because of all this excess rain. But they kind of looked at each other and thought, you know what, it's not that big of a deal. You know, we'll hold on to the roots of these mangroves and lower ourselves over the embankment. We'll wash ourselves off, pull ourselves back up. No big deal. And so they each turned around and grabbed a root of one of the many mangrove trees that marked the edge of this forest. And while holding on, they would lower their lower half down past the embankment until they were submerged. They rubbed all the mud off of themselves, being very careful not to let go of the mangrove at any point. And then as they were about to finish up and pull themselves back up and get back to their truck, when Brett loses his balance and somehow lets go of the mangrove root and slips down the steep embankment and suddenly the current takes him away from his friends and out to the middle of this river and before long he's getting pulled downstream. And so he yells out to Ashley and Sean who had their backs turned to him. They turn around, they see their friend and they instinctively leap into the river to try to go get him and help swim him back to the side. 
Now, all three of them were very competent swimmers, and so this was not a high panic situation. This was more like a inconvenience and maybe a little bit funny, and so that's why they left in no problem. They figured, you know, worst case scenario is we'll drift somewhere down there and we'll get out and we'll walk our way back to our car. But as soon as Sean and Ashley were free floating in this river, they felt how strong this current was, and it was way stronger than they were anticipating. And so they actually started to get a little bit worried, and they looked up ahead of them, and Brett, who had been in the water for, you know, 10 or 15 seconds before they leapt in, he had already moved way farther downstream than them. And so they decided, you know what, we have to get out, but we need to get to Brett first. We all need to get out at the same place. And so they decide they're going to swim downstream, meet up with Brett, and then get the heck out of that river as fast as they possibly can. And so they yell out to Brett to, hey, we're coming to get you. And they start swimming as fast as they possibly can. And with the help of the current, they manage to get all the way up to Brett relatively quickly, maybe a couple of minutes. And when they reach him, Sean and Ashley go in front of Brett. And then the three of them, they stop actively swimming and they allow the current to just kind of carry them downstream. And as they're drifting, they begin scouting the left side of the river for a solid clump of mangrove trees they can swim into. Because unless there's something to grab onto on the edge of this river, they can't pull themselves out. And so at this point, the trio is definitely uncomfortable being in the water because of how strong that current is. But they're confident they're going to find a viable landing spot and they're going to get out of here and it will be a great story. And so Sean is in the front, Ashley is right behind him, and then Brett is behind Ashley. And they're all about an arm's length away from each other. And they're drifting down this river for a couple of minutes. They're looking on the left side for a viable landing spot. And then all of a sudden, Ashley just yells out, Hey, I see something in the water. We need to get out. Find the nearest tree. Get out, get out, get out. And so Sean, he starts panicking. He doesn't even turn around to see what's going on behind him. Adrenaline kicks in and he swims as fast as he possibly can to a tree that's popped out of the river. It's literally growing in the middle of the river. And so he swims up to this tree. He manages to climb up to the first fork of the tree, which is maybe six or eight feet above the water. And as soon as he's up there, he turns around and looks down and he sees Ashley. He reaches down and he hoists Ashley up to the first fork with him. And then the pair turn around again to grab Brett, but Brett's not there. And so they look around, they're thinking, okay, did Brett not make it to the tree? Did the current pull him around? Is he at some other tree? You know, they're yelling out for him. They're looking for him, but there's no Brett. And so they're talking to each other, Ashley and Sean. They're saying, hey, did you, did he call out? Did you hear something? Did he give some indication about where he was going? And they're saying, no, I, I don't know where he is. And so they start climbing up the tree a little bit and trying to look down and up the river to see if maybe they can see him. And then all of a sudden, Sean notices something yellow flash beneath them in the water. And so he looks straight down and he sees this yellow thing down there. And so he nudges Ashley and he says, look. And so Ashley looks down, and as they're looking, they're about 10 feet off the water at this point, they see this yellow thing start rising up to the surface. Now, the water is so dark, they really can't tell what anything is unless it is at the surface. And so they're watching this yellow thing, and suddenly it comes out of the water, and they see it's Brett. He's got his yellow jacket on. That's what they saw. And Brett is in the mouth of a 13-foot-long saltwater crocodile. He is face down and his left side is being held in this animal's mouth and he's not moving. And so Sean and Ashley are so scared, they're just frozen. They're just staring at this monster that's in the water that's holding their friend underwater and they can't do anything about it. And for two minutes, they just stand there looking at this animal, wondering what's going to happen. And for those entire two minutes, the crocodile stared right back up at Ashley and Sean as if it was showing them what it was going to do to them once they got in the water. That I've done this to your friend, I'm getting you to as well. And so they're staring at this animal when suddenly it just kind of goes underneath the water back down into the black abyss and it, along with Brett, just disappear. Ashley and Sean are so terrified that they can't even grieve for their friend. They can't feel sad for him. It's like they just go into survival mode. And without saying anything to each other, they just start climbing up this tree as fast and as far as they possibly can. And they only manage to get up maybe a couple more feet to two more branches. One's at about 10 or 12 feet off the water and the other is at about 15 feet off the water. And so Sean makes it onto the lower branch and then Ashley makes it onto the slightly higher branch. And then once they're situated on their branch and one arm is firmly wrapped around the trunk of the tree, they're able to kind of breathe for a second and take stock of their situation. And even though, of course, the elephant in the room here is that their friend was just eaten by a crocodile, but it's like they can't process that yet. Instead, they start talking about, okay, well, our families, they're going to recognize our absence and they're going to tell the police and the police are going to launch a search and they're going to come find us. 
Both of them were confident, or they acted confident that that was going to happen, but they also knew that there was no timeline for this. It could be hours or days until this actually happened. And so as these two teens are sitting on their branches, the reality of their situation really started to come crashing down on them. Because yeah, they're safe in this tree, but how long can they possibly stay in this tree for? I mean, eventually they're gonna need to fall asleep. And if they fall asleep, are they gonna fall out of the tree and land in the water with this crocodile? I mean, they just didn't know how this was gonna turn out. And so as the two began comforting each other, you know, reassuring each other that, oh no, it's gonna be just fine. Someone's gonna find us tonight or tomorrow will be just fine. As they're doing that, Ashley suddenly stops talking to Sean and just looks straight down. And so Sean realizes what Ashley's doing and he matches his gaze and he looks straight down and at the base of their tree in that black water is the 13 foot long saltwater crocodile. It's back and it no longer has Brett in its mouth. They have no idea where Brett is, he's just gone. Saltwater crocodiles are considered the most aggressive and dangerous crocodiles in the world. And they are one of only two crocodile species that will actively hunt humans when given a chance. And so these two teens are helpless in this tree. All they have is some separation from the black water and this animal down below. And so they just find themselves staring straight down at this crocodile. And in turn, this crocodile just stares right back up at them. It's very clearly waiting for them. It wants them to come out of the tree so it can eat them. And so the crocodile just continuously repositions itself all around the tree. It's just keeping the top of its head out of the water so its eyes can look up at them. And so the teens are just praying that at some point it will grow tired of them and will leave. And after several hours, right as the sun is about to set, this crocodile does seem to give up on them and it drifts under the water and disappears. After a couple of minutes, Sean, who was on the slightly lower branch, decides he doesn't want to be any closer to the water than he needs to be, and he's going to climb up to Ashley's branch. And so he very carefully stands up on his branch, he makes sure he's got solid footing, and then he reaches up and he grabs a branch with his right hand, and he kind of tests it, and he feels like it's pretty sturdy, and then he puts all his weight on it and tries to reach for another branch when this one breaks. And as soon as that branch broke, Sean tumbled 10 feet into the water. So he hits the water, he goes all the way under, he sinks a few feet under, and immediately he's turned around and he's trying to swim as fast as he can to the surface and he's just expecting at any moment this crocodile is going to bite him. He gets to the surface and he looks around, it's a little bit dark, but he can immediately see his tree and he realizes the current has pulled him away from his tree. And so in a panic, he starts swimming and kicking his legs as hard as he possibly can to get back to this tree. And he knows the whole time he's kicking his legs, he's just attracting the attention of this crocodile, but he's got nothing else he can do. He's got no other tree he can reasonably get to that will provide safety from this animal. And so with every ounce of energy he's got, he kicks and swims, and finally he manages to grab a root of this tree that his friend is still inside of, and he begins pulling himself with his lower half still submerged in the water. And so as he's dragging himself towards the trunk of this tree, he's just waiting for this crocodile to bite down on his legs. And finally he gets to the trunk of the tree and he's able to pull his body out of the water and he clambers up to that original branch he was on. And then he and Ashley work to get him up to Ashley's branch. And as soon as he sits down, next to Ashley and he's secure, they both look down and just a little ways away from the tree, basically in the area where Sean had just landed in the water, they see with the little light that is left, this crocodile swimming right back over to the tree and it camps out right underneath. Sean had gotten out just in time. When the sun finally did set about 10 or 15 minutes later, it became pitch black. There's no ambient light in this part of the world. There aren't any buildings or cities close enough to this area. And so it is truly pitch black. And so they could no longer see the crocodile down below. But they knew it was there because periodically they would hear it repositioning itself right underneath them. Also, because it was so dark, the two teens could not actually see each other. And so they began holding on to each other, and then anytime either of them moved, they would announce their movement to the other, just so they knew they had not fallen asleep and were not falling out of the tree to a horrible death. And so a few hours went by like this, where it was silence with the exception of the sounds of this crocodile repositioning itself periodically. 
a little after midnight, a huge storm rolled into this area and it began absolutely downpouring and the raindrops that were hitting the river were so loud that the teens could no longer hear the sound of this crocodile. And so they had no idea if it was still down below them or not. But every time lightning would strike, it would illuminate the sky for that flash of a second. And in that flash, they would look down and there would be the crocodile. After several hours of this super intense downpour, the two teens also started to become concerned that all this additional rain could raise the water level of the river all the way up high enough that this crocodile might be able to jump out and reach their legs. But because it was so dark, they couldn't actually see the top of the water, and so they had no way of knowing if the water levels were actually rising or not. And so they both kind of sucked their legs up onto this branch and tried to make themselves as small as they could while still remaining anchored to each other and also to the branch. And that's how they sat for the next several hours, just hoping they would survive the night. Finally, when the sun came up that following morning, the teens immediately noticed that the crocodile was still right below them, just lurking at the base of the tree, waiting for them. And they also noticed the water level of the river had clearly come up quite a bit. And so if they weren't rescued soon, there was a good chance that another heavy rainstorm, that crocodile would be in range of them and there was nowhere they could go. They were as high up as they could get. Not to mention the fact they were hypothermic, they were weak, they were tired, and if you fall asleep, you're gonna fall in the water. And so the two teens, they knew they did not have much time left. Luckily, at 10 a.m. that morning, they heard the sound of a police officer who was out in the mangrove forest. It turned out their families had recognized their absence. They had called the police, and that morning, a search had been launched. They had found their truck and then had been walking down the river yelling out to them, and then they finally did find them. Initially, when they located these two teens stuck in the tree, they called in a helicopter to hover over them and lower down a ladder that could climb back up. But when the helicopter got close to this tree, the rotor wash from the spinning blades, it practically blew the boys out of the tree. And this crocodile was still in the water. The rescuers could see it, the boys could still see it. And so there was this fear that the helicopter would literally send them into the water to their death. And so they had to abandon the helicopter approach. However, the blades of that helicopter did ultimately scare this crocodile and the crocodile swam away. And so as soon as the helicopter was off station, they had a boat come in and the boat got right underneath the two boys. They jumped down into it and they were brought to safety. The two boys were brought to a hospital where doctors determined they were physically okay, but both of them were severely traumatized from what they had just been through. As for Brett, despite an exhaustive search of that river, they never found his body or any of his clothing or any belongings he had on him, and they never found the crocodile that killed all. Early on the morning of Friday, August 9th, 1991, in a small town in South Central Arizona, a man stepped out of his home and stood quietly on the doorstep, his face turned to the east where the sun was just starting to show above the horizon. Even though he had gotten up early so he could get some gardening in before the real heat of the day set in, now that he was actually outside, he showed absolutely no sign of hurrying. His unlined face and dark eyes were serene as he watched the first rays of light spreading over the desert that bordered one side of the property where he lived and the cotton fields that bordered the other side. Once the sun was up, the man stood with his eyes closed, still as a statue, for several more minutes, taking in the sounds of the world waking up around him. He could hear the hum of insects, along with birds cooing and scratching in the dirt for seeds. He was also aware of the steady rhythm of his own breathing and the movement of a very slight breeze through the branches of the nearby cottonwood trees he had planted two years ago. For 36-year-old Buddhist monk Parush Kanthong, these early morning hours that he could spend alone in his garden were often the most peaceful and reflective part of his day. Now, opening his eyes, Parush turned his attention to the narrow path along the side of the single-story white stucco building with the red roof that he and five other monks called home. When Parush had first arrived in Arizona from his native Thailand eight years ago, he had led a small Buddhist community in the state capital of Phoenix. But back in 1985, after the community had scraped together enough money to buy these five acres of rural farmland located 20 miles west of Phoenix, Parush had worked tirelessly to collect the money that allowed them to build this modest temple, which was called Wat Pram Kunaram. 
Since opening its doors two years ago, the temple had become an important site of worship for the 1,300 members of Arizona's scattered Thai Buddhist community. And as the abbot of the temple, an abbot is the leader of a monastery, Parush oversaw not only the services, classes, and festivals that the temple offered its worshippers, but he also oversaw the training and education of the five monks and three novices and temple helpers who currently lived there. Stepping away from the door he had been standing in that led back into the temple's dining room, kitchen, and simple bedrooms, Parush adjusted his bright saffron orange robe and began walking along the narrow path that ran the length of the temple. He listened to the gentle slap of his sandals as he slowly walked past the eggplant, basil, lemongrass, and mint that he had planted alongside the mango, banana, pomegranate, and loquat trees. Coming to a stop near the end of the path, Parush knelt down in front of one of the many little shrines that dotted the garden. As he knelt, he picked up a handful of dry soil and let it run through his fingers. Back in Thailand, August was the wettest month of the year when rice farmers could expect 19 inches of rain. And until his move to Arizona at the age of 28, Parush marked his country's rainy season by staying indoors, so there was no chance that he and his fellow monks might accidentally step on and damage any of the rice seedlings growing in the nearby paddies. But out here in the Arizona desert, things were totally different. Water was scarce, and so it was a very precious commodity. If your property met certain minimum size requirements, you could sign up for a weekly water distribution that was delivered to each property through an irrigation system of pipes and gates. While the temple property was too small to qualify for this water allotment, Perush had worked out an agreement with his neighbor, Betty Kraft, whose property also failed on its own to meet the minimum size requirements, but together, their two properties were big enough to sign up for a weekly water distribution, and so they did that, and Perush and Betty shared the water between them. He grinned as he thought of Betty. She loved gardening as much as he did. He'd see her that night, since Friday was the night that the town posted the weekly water distribution schedule. He knew Betty always worried that he might forget to close the headgate on the temple's property, which prevented their shared water allotment from flowing through to the next property along the irrigation line. And so, on whatever day they were scheduled to get their water, Betty almost always called Perush just to make sure that he had adjusted the headgate and opened his hoses so they wouldn't waste or lose even a single drop of their shared water. That was good, though. Perush always enjoyed comparing notes with Betty, and he would find out this evening how her fig trees were doing. Maybe that was something he should add next year to the gardens at the temple. Collecting a handful of basil and lemongrass, Perush felt the air growing hotter, and he knew that soon he would hear the sounds of activity inside the monastery as the monks began their morning routine of meditation and work around the temple grounds. As he enjoyed his last few minutes of solitude, Perush was again thankful for the temple's remote location. In Thailand, practically the entire population was Buddhist, but in Arizona, the sight of Thai monks in their bright orange robes with their shaved heads was unusual, and it had drawn a lot of public attention and curiosity at the temple in Phoenix. But here, out in Waddell, the temple's location was so far away from the center of town that many of the town's 1,500 residents didn't even know it existed. And those who did, like Betty, they had come to welcome the sight of the monks in their orange robes quietly going about their business. And so, Perush and the other monks and Thai members of the temple were all basically left alone to meditate and practice their religion. At the core of their religion, Buddhism, is the belief that human life is one of suffering, and the only way to achieve enlightenment, or nirvana, is through meditation, spiritual and physical labor, and good behavior. Buddhists also believe in reincarnation, that you are reborn again and again after death until you reach that final state of enlightenment and you are released from suffering. Buddhist monks play a key role in the religion by living a very simple life that allows them to meditate not only on their own path to enlightenment and acceptance of the present moment, but on enlightenment, peace, and nonviolence for all people. By 11 a.m., the temperature outside had reached 101 degrees Fahrenheit, and not even the cottonwood trees could shade Perush from the heat. Soon, it would be time for the monks to eat their single meal of the day. 
it would be made and served at the temple by a member of the community whose gift of time and food would count as service merits along the path to enlightenment. After lunch, Purush would check in with the temple's newest resident, a 75-year-old nun from Thailand who had moved into the temple just three weeks earlier. Visiting her was her 17-year-old grandson and novice monk, an American high school student named Matthew. Purush stood up and brushed the dirt from his knees and robes, and then he turned and walked back down the path to the side entrance of the temple that he had been standing in earlier. Before stepping back inside, he took off his sandals, and he enjoyed the smell of cooking rice wafting out from the kitchen. Once inside, Purush closed the door behind him, and then he stood there quietly for a moment. He let go of all the noise he was hearing both inside and outside of his mind. Then he opened his eyes and stepped into the nearby kitchen, and he left his handful of freshly picked herbs on the counter. At 8.30 a.m. the next day, Saturday, August 10th, Betty Craft called the temple. At the local well last night, she and Perush had seen that their water distribution was scheduled for that day, the 10th. But that morning, Betty had found out that the distribution was going to start a bit earlier than usual. So she was calling Perush to let him know, and she wanted to remind him, again, to make sure the temple's water headgate was closed. But after dialing the number to the temple, the phone didn't ring. It was just silent. Betty didn't know why this was, and after trying again and still getting nothing, she decided to just hop in her car and make the short drive over to the temple to tell Perush in person. A few minutes later, Betty drove through the open gates of the concrete wall that surrounded the temple's five-acre lot, and she pulled into the temple's parking area and parked her car. Getting out, she walked over to the side entrance that she knew led into the monk's living quarters. Once there, Betty quickly saw that the temple's hoses were open, water was running out of them. But it struck her as odd that Perush had not arranged the hoses so that all the water would run into his gardens. Instead, some of the water had started to collect on the little patio right outside the door and was even overflowing into the parking lot down below. Betty felt even more puzzled when she knocked on the side door and didn't get an answer. The same thing happened when she walked around to the front entrance that led directly into the large square temple sanctuary where the monks conducted services. Not only did no one answer either door, but everything inside the building seemed unusually quiet. But not wanting to enter the monk's space without an invitation, and checking once more that the grounds were empty, Betty shrugged her shoulders. At least she knew that the temple's hoses were on and the headgate was closed. So she jumped back into her car and returned to her own property. Two hours later, at 10.40 a.m., another car drove through the open gates of the temple into the front parking lot. Inside the car were two Thai women who were friends and who were both members of the temple. They were there to make the monks' Saturday meal. When the car came to a stop, the two women looked around and noticed something strange. There was not a single person outside working in the vegetable gardens or walking on the meditation paths. The women figured there must be a reason for this, so they just got out and headed for the front door of the temple. But before they could reach the door, they had to walk around this large puddle of water that had formed in front of the temple from all of the water pouring out of the open hoses. The women wondered why the hoses had not been adjusted to aim in other directions, but ultimately they ignored the growing puddle, and one of the women reached out and grabbed the front door handle, but when she pulled it, she saw it was locked. This was now the third irregularity that the two women had spotted in the span of just a couple of minutes. 51-year-old Chawi Borders and her friend Primshat Hash were starting to get a bad feeling about what they were seeing at the temple. Something just felt off. But they quickly reminded themselves that they needed to just focus on what they were doing at the temple, not what the monks might be doing. They were there to make lunch and earn service merits. And besides, the two women agreed that the monks must just be inside studying or meditating, and as for the water and locked door, the monks must have just forgotten to turn off the irrigation system and open the front door to the sanctuary. So the two women left the front door and headed around to the unlocked side entrance. They took off their shoes outside and then stepped inside. The room they walked into was the dining room. To their left was a door that led to the kitchen. Straight in front of them was that large square temple worship area. And then to their right was a hallway that led down to five bedrooms that made up the monks' living quarters. The women turned left and went straight into the kitchen and got to work preparing the monks' lunch. 
but they hadn't been there for very long before Primshot thought she'd discovered the reason for at least some of the irregularities they had witnessed that morning. As she had walked from the kitchen back toward the side entrance to go back outside and get something from the car, she had glanced quickly down the hallway that led to the monk's five bedrooms, and at the front of that hallway, close to where she was, was a small sitting area with a couple of sofas inside. And in this sitting area, Primshot saw the monks were lying quietly on the floor between these two sofas. After getting what she needed from the car, Primshot returned to the kitchen and told her friend, Chawi, that she had just seen the monks in the sitting area and that they were either sleeping or praying. Not wanting to disturb them, the two women went about their meal preparation very quietly, and at some point, when Chawi thought she heard the faint ring of a phone, she immediately stepped out of the kitchen into the dining room to answer the phone before the sound could interrupt the monk's concentration or rest. But when she put the phone to her ear, she heard nothing. Thinking she must have picked up the wrong phone, as there was two phones in the dining room, she walked across the room to the other phone and put that phone to her ear, but this as well was silent. But as she stood there with the silent phone pressed to her ear, she looked at the first phone she had picked up, and she could tell right away that the cord connecting the receiver to the phone had been cut. Then she pulled the phone in her hand away from her ear, and she saw the same thing. The phone's cord was cut. As she realized that clearly she had not heard a phone ring because now she's seeing neither phone would work, Chawi just happened to glance at the sitting room at the front of the hallway where the monks were lying on the floor in various attitudes of prayer. And almost absently, she noticed that mixed among the colorful saffron robes that the monks wore was the long white shirt and pants worn by the elderly nun who had joined the monastery with her grandson just a few weeks ago. Chawi was suddenly very uneasy. She knew that could not possibly be right. It was absolutely forbidden that a male monk who took strict vows of celibacy would ever lie down next to a woman, let alone lie close enough that their bodies or robes would be touching. As Chawi stood there frozen, her friend Primshot stepped out into the dining room as well and began to let out this terrible wail because something else was horribly wrong with what the two women were looking at. There was blood everywhere in the sitting area. There was blood on the floor, on the walls, and on the two sofas. It was 11.09 a.m. that Saturday morning when the emergency call came in to the dispatcher at the Maricopa County Sheriff's Department. Chawi and Primshot, who were totally hysterical, had run barefoot to the house of a neighbor who had called 911. By 11.21 a.m., the first law enforcement officer had skidded to a stop in the temple parking lot, and three minutes later, four more officers had arrived. By 11.45 a.m., the perimeter of the temple grounds had been marked off with yellow crime scene tape, and the parking lot was full of police and medical personnel. And the news had already spread like wildfire through the Buddhist community and among local, state, and national media. It was also making headlines back in Thailand, because the temple was now the site of the worst mass murder in Arizona history. Inside that small sitting room, police had found nine people. Every single inhabitant of the temple, including the abbot, Purush, all of them dead. Physical evidence at the scene did not paint a complete picture, but it did allow police to establish a few theories about what happened. There had been at least two killers. On the carpet near the victims were 17 22 caliber casings and three spent shotgun shells. A nearby storage room had been sprayed with a fire extinguisher, and in the foam on the floor, police counted two different sized sets of footprints made by people wearing combat-style boots. These small monastic cubicles where the monks slept had been ransacked and vandalized. The sleeping mats had been pulled off of the wooden bed frames, and what little furniture there was had been broken and knocked to the ground. Police were also able to determine that the killers had found the temple safe, but they had not been able to open it. What puzzled investigators was the fact that the temple's worship area, which was that large square room not far from the sitting area where the bodies had been found, appeared to be untouched, despite the fact that in the worship area, right near the altar, was a visible money tree with at least 20 bills still clipped to the branches. So if this had been a robbery, why didn't the robbers take those bills? Whoever had committed the crime had also left another clue behind. 
overlaying the stench of clotting blood, spent ammunition, and human flesh that had already begun to decompose, there was also the smell of something else that was completely out of place in a Buddhist monastery, the stale but strong scent of cigarette smoke. Even as the first responders to the crime scene went about their grisly work of photographing the dead and collecting evidence, the sheriff of Maricopa County, 55-year-old Tom Agnos, knew his department was in way over its head trying to deal with a mass murder. So he immediately began the process of pulling together a multi-agency task force to help investigate the crime, process the crime scene, and collect and analyze any forensic evidence. But before the police could even write up their preliminary crime scene report, and just hours after the bodies had been discovered, along with the media, hundreds of members of the Asian community in and around Phoenix were gathering outside the temple wall. In the 101 degree Fahrenheit heat, reporters had already begun to broadcast and air interviews, putting forward wildly different and competing theories about possible motives for the killings. Some reports speculated that the murders were a robbery or a hate crime directed at the Asian and Buddhist communities. Others speculated that the killings were gang-related or drug-related, that maybe the temple itself or some of the monks or temple residents had direct connections to the growing trade in heroin coming out of Thailand into the United States. Meanwhile, based on their discussions with Betty Kraft, who had met with Perush at the local well in Waddell at 9.30 p.m. on the night of August 9th, along with findings from the medical examiner's office, the investigators were able to narrow down the time of the murders to between 2 and 4 a.m. on the morning of August 10th. But despite all the evidence of violence and destruction left at the crime scene, by August 12th, two days after the mass murder, the best lead that investigators had was just a report of a red SUV, a Ford Bronco with a white stripe that had been seen by several different witnesses driving away from the area where the temple was located around the time that the murders were likely to have been committed. Over the next few weeks, more than 60 law enforcement personnel would follow up on more than 500 leads, including that report of the Red Ford Bronco, but none of those leads would pan out. Officers dug into the private lives of the nine victims, but they just could not come up with any person or group who might have wanted one of them or all of them dead. Members of the Asian community had raised a $10,000 reward for information leading to the killers, but no one had come forward with anything useful. But almost exactly one month after the murders, the task force would receive what they believed was their first real break in the case. On Monday, September 10th, police in Tucson, Arizona, called the special task force headquarters in Phoenix, saying they had just gotten a tip related to the mass murder. The tip had come in that morning from a 24-year-old patient at the Tucson Psychiatric Institute who had checked himself into the facility after attempting suicide. The patient, who gave police several false names before giving them his real name, Michael Lawrence McGraw, was known in his hometown neighborhood of South Tucson by yet another name, Crazy Mike. He told Tucson police that he had something to say about, quote, some kind of murders that happened in Phoenix at the Buddhist temple. As soon as they got this tip, investigators drove to Tucson and went through the administrative process of getting Mike released from the psychiatric hospital so they could drive him back to Phoenix for questioning. Once that was done and Crazy Mike was in Phoenix, investigators at the task force headquarters spent the next three days questioning him during interrogations that sometimes lasted longer than 12 hours at a stretch. Between sessions, Mike was taken to a four-star Sheridan hotel and treated to room service, but he was never allowed to sleep for more than a few hours at a stretch, and he did not have a lawyer with him for the interrogations. Eventually, Crazy Mike confessed to the temple murders, although audio recordings of the interrogation showed that Mike needed and got a lot of help from his interrogators before he actually got the details of the crime straight. On September 13th, three days after Mike had been brought in for questioning, police had arrested four other men from Tucson that Mike had said were also involved in the killings. All four of the accused were acquaintances of Mike, and all four were subjected to the same interrogation techniques that detectives had employed when they had questioned Mike. And three of the four men confessed to the murders and were immediately charged with multiple homicides. 
The fourth man had a solid alibi and just refused to yield to what the courts would later describe as questionable interrogation techniques by the task force. But by late September, the case against the so-called Tucson Four, which was Crazy Mike and the three other men who confessed, quickly fell apart. Each of the suspects recanted their confessions, saying they were, quote, coerced by investigators who frightened them, gave them details about the case, and told them that their friends had already implicated them in the crime, end quote. Not only were investigators back to square one, but the botched interrogations of the Tucson Four had resulted in public outcry and criticism of the police and caused divisions inside of the task force, which now numbered more than 200 people. The real first break in the Waddell Temple Massacre would not come until October 24th, six weeks after the killings. And that break was actually based on a lead that the police had gotten one month earlier on September 21st and had just failed to follow up on. It would turn out that on the same day that Crazy Mike phoned the Tucson Police Department on September 21st saying he had information about the murders, investigators for the special task force had also received a tip from the Office of Special Investigations at the Luke Air Force Base. Luke Air Force Base is located about six miles east of the Waddell Temple. The Office of Special Investigations, which is the name of the military police unit that provides law enforcement on the base, had notified the task force that they had picked up a weapon from someone driving on base, and the weapon matched the description of the one used in the Temple Massacre. But in all the excitement of getting the phone tip from Crazy Mike at the psychiatric hospital and having a real live suspect to interrogate, task force detectives did not send this weapon in for testing. Instead, after picking the weapon up from Luke Air Force Base, one of the sergeants on the task force literally put the weapon behind a door in a corner of his office, and then he forgot about it until four weeks later when the case against the Tucson Four started to implode. At that point, with the task force scrambling for new leads, the sergeant remembered the weapon and they would send it off for testing at the Arizona State Crime Lab. The results of that test came back four days later on October 24th, and two days after that on October 26th, investigators arrested two people in connection with the mass murder. And the story that these two people would tell police left even the most hardened detectives feeling shocked and repulsed. Based on the testimony of these two individuals, here is a reconstruction of what really happened in the early morning hours of Saturday, August 10th, inside the Waddell Temple. The last communication between the residents of the Waddell Temple and the outside world happened at about 11 p.m. on the night of Friday, August 9th. Perush, the abbot of the temple, had already come back from his meeting at the local well with neighbor Betty Kraft. Other monks had also returned to the temple after performing a blessing ceremony at the house of one of the temple members earlier that evening. At 11, one of the monks telephoned the woman who had prepared that day's noontime meal, asking if she would like to return to the temple the next day, Saturday, an offer she later told police she had declined. After 11 p.m., finished with their daily routine of meditation, prayer, work, and teaching, four of the temple's residents made their way to the small sitting room to talk and watch TV. The temple's gentle 75-year-old nun, who had spent most of her life in Thailand doing the back-breaking work of planting and harvesting rice, had made her way to her tiny sleeping quarters, less a bedroom than a closet, that had just enough space inside for a simple sleeping mat, but which gave her the required physical separation from the monks. But just as the evening was coming to a close for the residents of the temple, the night was just getting started for two local teenage boys, one 16 years old and one 17 years old. This was a night, in fact, that had been a long time in the making. Three months earlier, one of the teen's brothers had told them that the Waddell Temple was full of riches like golden Buddha statues and a safe full of money. And this brother would know because he had actually spent six weeks that summer living in the temple as a novice monk. And so the 16-year-old and the 17-year-old became obsessed with this temple and these riches. But as they thought more and more about robbing the temple, they realized they weren't just interested in the money. They were also interested in treating this robbery like it was a full-scale military operation. 
and they both agreed that for this military operation to be successful, they would have to pull it off without leaving any witnesses. So back in June of 1991, while Perush and his fellow monks were out in the temple gardens just starting to plant melons, basil, corn, and sweet potatoes, the two teens started preparing for their robbery slash war game. Both of the boys had fathers who worked at the nearby Luke Air Force Base, so the boys went to the base store and over a period of time bought the gear they needed. Boots, camouflage hats, scarves, military belts and goggles, battle harnesses, and military knives and flashlights. Getting the weapons wasn't hard either. The 16-year-old boy had access to his father's 20-gauge pump-action shotgun that he loaded up with birdshot. When you fire birdshot, it's like firing a cluster of small metal BBs all at once. And the 17-year-old would borrow a 22 caliber rifle from an unsuspecting acquaintance. By late summer, after weeks of talk and planning, the two teen boys had settled on a date. They'd arrive at the temple late on the night of Friday, August 9th, when they knew all the monks would be inside the temple. So just before midnight, on that Friday night, the two boys, dressed in their full military outfits and driving an older model Mustang, turned off the car headlights as they rolled through the open gates of the temple and parked the car in the far corner of the parking lot. The boys pulled on their gloves and then checked to make sure their guns were loaded and that all the gear they would need was either hooked onto their bodies or in their respective duffel bags. Then, after nodding to one another, they put their big goggles over their eyes, pulled their hats down tight over their foreheads, and pulled their scarves up around their nose and mouths. Then they got out of the car and began walking toward the side door of the temple that led into the dining room. Just after midnight on August 10th, the quiet inside the temple was suddenly shattered. The four monks in the sitting area heard a bang as the side door was suddenly flung open, and a moment later, two people dressed in military gear were dragging them out of their seats. The air was filled with shouts, hit the dirt, down on the floor, now, now, now! As the monks stumbled first to their feet and then to their knees, they stared in shock at these intruders who seemed to have just come out of nowhere. It was impossible to see the boys' faces, but the monks saw that one of the attackers was over six feet tall and must have weighed over 200 pounds. Up close, both of the boys smelled like beer, cigarettes, and sweat. But the monks hardly had time to process any of this before the intruders split up one of them screaming and waving a long-barreled gun as he circled the four monks who were now kneeling on the floor in the six-foot-wide space between the two-person and six-person sofas on opposite sides of the sitting area. Meanwhile, the other intruder ran down that narrow hallway leading to the temple's five bedrooms, where he dragged the remaining two monks, one novice monk, and the temple helper back to the sitting room, where they also were forced at gunpoint to join the circle of monks in the cramped space between the sofas. It was obvious after one look in the monks' bare, empty bedrooms that this temple was not full of riches like the boys had hoped. But... That didn't stop the two boys from taking turns vandalizing, smashing, and destroying everything in front of them. And when one of the boys pulled open the door of the final room at the end of the hallway, which was really just a large closet, cowering on her knees right in front of him was the temple's oldest resident, the tiny 75-year-old nun and grandmother who had only arrived at the temple three weeks earlier with her 17-year-old grandson. Grabbing hold of her white shirt dress, the intruder dragged her back to the sitting area and then forced her to take her place amongst the others. After an hour spent ransacking the living quarters and temple office, the only treasure the two boys had found was a safe that they could not figure out how to open, and some envelopes of cash offerings from members of the temple. So, frustrated, the two boys would spend their second hour in the temple, switching back and forth between terrorism and more destruction. Taking turns, they circled their kneeling captives, stepping on their legs and backs, prodding them with the barrels of the rifle and the shotgun, and jumping on and off the seats of the sofa as they made their way around and around, demanding the combination to the safe and the location of any hidden valuables they were sure the monks must have somewhere. And as they tortured and degraded the nine people in front of them, the boys smoked one cigarette after another, blowing the smoke into their captives' faces and crushing out the butt of each cigarette in a big glass ashtray that they had placed in the center of their human circle. But from the very first moment that the boys had broken into the temple, the response from the monks totally threw them off. 
These were not people who wanted to fight or argue or beg or even resist. Instead, the more violent and threatening the boys became, the less of a reaction they got from their victims. Instead, the monks looked around the circle and calmly made faces of encouragement at the terrified novice monk and the temple helper who just went by the simple name of boy and the 75-year-old nun. At some point, Purush laced his fingers together in prayer and began to chant. The other five monks, who, like him, had spent years learning to accept, without question or resistance, every moment and circumstance in their lives, joined him. In Buddhism, one of the greatest meditations of all is the meditation on the inevitability of death. And as Purush looked from face to face around the circle, he wanted each one of them to know that however and whenever death came, it would bring the gift of rebirth and enlightenment. So even as the intruders physically and verbally assaulted them, trying to get them to not only give up the code to the safe, but to react to their captors with fear, Purush and the other monks just continued to mentally withdraw into the calm space of their meditation and prayer, and their strength appeared to give the other non-monks the resolve they needed to relax and be calm as well. And before long, the 17-year-old novice monk, the temple worker they called boy, and the 75-year-old nun had all bowed their heads as well and closed their eyes. And so by the time the bigger of the two boys finally lifted the barrel of the shotgun and fired four rounds into the circle of kneeling figures, blowing off kneecaps and fingers and sending birdshot into the soft skin of necks and faces, his victims had already left the world of flesh and blood behind. As the victims silently absorbed the blasts from the shotgun, the second intruder walked up behind one of the victims, he raised his rifle and he fired two shots into the back of their head. As the victim slumped forward with their hands still laced together in front of their chest in prayer, the other eight victims didn't make a sound. They just continued to pray and meditate, knowing they were next. For the next several minutes, the second attacker slowly made his way around the circle, systematically putting at least two rounds into the back of each of the victim's skulls. After making sure that all nine people inside the temple were dead, the two intruders packed up the money and personal items they had stolen from the temple and headed back out the side door. They ran back to their car, pulling the scarves down from their sweat-soaked faces and began gulping in the hot, dry, and clean desert air. And then they drove out through the open gates of the Buddhist temple and back into their everyday normal lives. Except that 12 days later, on August 21st, military police on Luke Air Force Base found a 22 caliber rifle in the trunk of a car they had pulled over for suspicious activity. The rifle belonged to the driver, who had just recently loaned the weapon to the passenger with him in the car, a 17-year-old teenager named Jonathan Duty. It wasn't until one month later, September 20th, that the police report describing the traffic stop and the weapon would find its way to the task force investigating the mass murder, and it would be four weeks after that before members of the task force would finally get around to having that weapon tested and find that it was the murder weapon used in the temple massacre. Once those results came back in, it would take two days for task force investigators to track the rifle back to 17-year-old Jonathan Duty and to his accomplice, a 16-year-old named Alex Garcia, who was six foot three inches tall and who weighed 220 pounds. Alex was the first to confess to the murders, saying that Jonathan was both the mastermind of the robbery and the one who walked around the ring of victims and shot them all in the head, execution style. It was also Jonathan Duty's half-brother, who had spent time as a novice monk living in the temple that summer, who had said there were riches inside of the temple. When the boys were asked why they committed this horrible crime, Jonathan told police he just wanted to get money to buy a car, and Alex told police he wanted, quote, walk-around money that would impress the girls. As for why they had killed everyone, they said they were just following their plan to not leave any witnesses behind. Although, despite claiming to have this well-thought-out military-style robbery all planned out going into the temple, it was fairly obvious that once the boys actually got inside, violence and destruction became the focus, not the robbery. This is likely why the boys did not take that money that was just sitting in plain sight near the altar in the worship room. 
At the end of the attack, Jonathan and Alex had left the temple with just under $2,800, two stereos, six cheap cameras, a low-end video recorder, a pair of binoculars, and a handheld bullhorn. In addition to their confessions, forensic analysis of the shoe prints and the saliva left on the cigarette butts found at the temple also conclusively linked the boys to the killing and the crime scene. After three different trials, both teenagers were finally convicted of multiple counts of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. The Tucson Four, who were falsely accused and arrested for the murders, were released from jail on November 2nd after Jonathan and Alex said that no one aside from themselves was involved in the temple murders and robbery. In 1994, Maricopa County paid the Tucson Four $2.8 million in damages for false arrests and defamation. Within weeks of the mass murders, the Waddell Temple reopened under the leadership of Abbot Winai Boonchom, a Thai monk who had been longtime friends with Purush. Boonchom said that after he had taken his friend's body back to Thailand to be cremated, Purush started appearing to Boonchom in his dreams. And even though the temple did not reopen as a living and study space for monks until after serious security measures were put in place, Boonchom moved into the temple immediately after the murders. When asked why he did that, Boonchom said that he saw his friend, Purush, everywhere in the temple, and so he was not afraid. Thank you for taking the time to watch the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please like, comment, and subscribe to the channel for more content. Your support means a lot to us and helps us create more videos that you'll love. We appreciate your feedback and would love to hear your thoughts on the video. What did you like about it? What could we improve? Your feedback will help us create better content in the future. If you're interested in seeing more videos like this, please subscribe to our channel. We post new videos every week, so you'll always have something new to watch. Once again, thank you for watching and supporting our channel. We hope to see you again soon. Smiling Face